Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to MGFA's wellness series webinar, Exercising and Staying Active at Home. My name is Jenna Umvalo and I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement at MGFA and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We're thrilled to have such a great turnout for today's event and we do ask that you remain on mute throughout the presentation. Please submit any questions that you have via the Zoom chat located on the Zoom menu bar, and we'll answer those during the Q&A segment. If by chance we miss your question or don't have time to answer it, I'll get you the answer via email after the webinar. Today's session is being recorded and it will be available online. I'd like to give special thanks for the support of our wellness series presenting sponsors, Alexion, Argenix, Momenta, and UCB and our supporting sponsor, Immunovant. We've got a great presentation ahead, and now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charlene hafer Macko. She's an Associate Professor of Neurology with the University of Maryland, and her research focuses on disability-adjusted exercise programs to promote health and wellness for individuals with MG and other neurological disabilities. She serves on MGFA's Medical Scientific Advisory Board, as well as MGFA's Education and Advocacy Committees. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Whoops, I'm at the bottom, sorry about that. Can you see it okay? Because I can only see my screen now. Is that okay? Um, so it is my pleasure to talk about um, exercising and staying active and staying healthy with your myasthenia while we're at home. And so thank you for, very much for this opportunity. Um, so typically when we think about exercise, often we think of very vigorous activities. We think of things that we're doing in groups and it's got to be fun. So I put square dancing on there. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, but these are things that we're not able to do with COVID. You know, we're, we're staying at home. We're, we're changing our routine. So the way that we exercise and stay fit needs to change to reflect that. But before we get, begin, what I wanted to do was first think about some of the health benefits of exercise. And I really love this to be interactive. So if you've got a piece of paper, think about two or three things that are health benefits for exercise. I can't ask all 400 of you, <laughs> what do you think? So um, some of the things that we often talk about as health benefits from exercises, number one is always trying to control our weight, um, looking tone, but also as we think about how it can provide advantages, we, we look at improving strength, having more endurance, or being able to do things for a much longer period of time, having better balance. I don't know if many of you found that as we're at home, we're sitting on our computers doing Zoom meeting, your balance isn't quite what it used to be. Um, I'm finding that I need to practice a little more. Uh, preventing injury. So as, as we think about exercise, you can um, think about protecting joints in osteoarthritis. As we build strength around a joint, we can prevent injury and reduce pain. Many of you are on steroids and inactivity drive osteoporosis. So exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise, can improve our bone health. And then again, as many people are on um, prednisone, increasing the weight and becoming more sedentary with the myasthenia, heart health is something that's on all of our minds. So improving blood pressure, cholesterol and glucose control are all things that we can do with exercise and it's a way to empower. Um, getting a better night's sleep, 
We used to send our kids outside to play. So as we're more active, we actually have a much more sound sleep and a more refreshing sleep. Exercise can improve mood, reduce anxiety. Um, it also has been shown to improve cognition. Um, in studies of college students, 20 minutes of exercise is as activating as that cup of coffee. So we might consider replacing that. Um, in addition, health or exercise has significant improvements in our immune health, which is important as you're living with an autoimmune disease. So with exercise, we first have to put up those cautions. So is it safe to exercise with your myasthenia gravis? So the first thing that we always want to address is we really should not be exercising when the MG is in crisis, or if you're, you're in a flare or an exacerbation. That is the time to really just focus on your health. And, and we'll get there. We'll be able to get you active later once we get the disease under control. Um, the MG needs to be managed and stable. When you're in those high fluctuations, that's not the time to get started. Um, You've got to address the other health concerns, and I'm gonna circle back to that before we start exercise. And then one of the things you really need to do is think about what your total activity tolerance is. I don't know if any of you have heard of the spoon theory, where we all have so many spoons and, <laughs> and you can only use up. Um, so many, you have so many in a day, and once you've used that allotment, that's it. You know, and I like to think of your energy in terms of a battery. You know, we do have to replenish that battery with rest or your evening sleep. And so think about that as you're, you're planning your activities. And then most importantly, it's, it's important to really talk to your care providers before you start your exercise. You want to talk to your neurologist um, because they're going to be your first line in understanding your myasthenia gravis. But you also want to ask your primary and your cardiologist or any of your other specialists before you begin your exercise program to really get that whole health clearance because exercise is part of your general health. Um, would it be possible to mute so that there's a little bit of interference going on. Thank you. Um, so there are many other conditions that can affect your ability to exercise. And one is heart disease. And, and this is probably the most, it and lung disease are one of the big things that we really want to address before you exercise. <coughs> if you have heart disease, you want to check with your cardiologist before you exercise. Once you're stable, they may get you into a cardiac rehab program, which we can introduce with your getting started with myasthenia. Lung disease like COPD or asthma may interfere with your ability to be active. And then there's a whole host of other things. And, and these are other things that I also like to look at in terms of your myasthenia looking for other things that may contribute to your fatigue and that are limiting your activity. So in the legs, poor circulation, um, pain or orthopedic conditions may affect the way you move. Sleep disorders like insomnia from that prednisone or sleep apnea, if these are not addressed, may lead to fatigue and um, inability to really get going. Anemia, which is a low blood count in the way we deliver oxygen to the, your muscles that need to, it, to fuel them. Um, thyroid conditions, which are common as a, uh, many people with MG may also have a thyroid condition. Muscle disorders, nerve neuropathy, depression may make it hard to get started. And then just like we have medications for that may make it um, uh, we would need to consider with myasthenia, beta blockers and other medicines may affect exercise capacity. 
And then finally is deconditioning. So as we've been sitting in our homes since March, and now we want to get started, we've got three months of deconditioning that we have to overcome. The next one are those red flags. These are times we should not exercise. So if you've got an active health issue or an infection, just take it easy. Um, if your MG is active, if you've got joint pains, let's address those first. If your exercise is producing soreness or pain, we've got to modify what you do. If you can't breathe and talk or talk during your exercise, boy, you push too hard. If you have chest pain, let's go see your doc about that. Or if you have a racing heart that just won't quiet, let's get seen for that. Or if you feel lightheaded or dehydrated during exercise, these are, are things that you should back off, ask your doctor, and then let's get a different plan or a different time to start the exercise. So now that we've got our warnings out of the way, how are we going to do exercise at home? So there's, there are a lot of opportunities. So one of the things I like a lot is chair yoga. Um, if your balance is poor or if your endurance isn't high, um, there's lots of good tapes. There's things on Netflix or Prime or on the internet, YouTubes that could help drive. And I see some folks stretching. It's kind of fun. Um, the bottom on the left is to remind me, um, Breathing is very important and we're going to come back to that. So really engaging in some breathing exercises. Um, if you're a weightlifter, one of the things we may do is on the bottom here, we have someone sitting on a balance ball doing theraband exercises. So they're rubber bands of different um, strengths. There are lots of apps. And then um, many of my patients always say, I'm not exercising, but you know, if you think about the things that you do at home, many of the activities can be tiring, and these are things that we enjoy and get a sense of accomplishment when we are active at home. So cleaning dishes I have in there, folding clothes, um, sitting, cutting vegetables. These are things that you know you may not think of as exercise, but it's a way to be active, to contribute um, at home, and they're very enjoyable. Gardening, so anything you can do to while you're socially staying at home, um, engage. So what is the evidence for myasthenia gravis and exercise? Probably the first um, studies that came out in the mid, uh, like 2000s, like 2006, were exercises for pulmonary training. And so many of them um, were what we call just case control studies where they enrolled patients and just saw, was it feasible and did they get improvement? There was one randomized study, which means people got an active treatment versus a control. So they could compare the, what um, the active treatment actually did. And the one that was randomized to 27 individuals with generalized myasthenia, so not restricted to the eyes, and they exercised them three days a week for eight weeks or two months. And what they did was they included 10 minutes of different types of exercise. And in total, they were with the trainer for about 45 minutes each of those three days a week. And they included exercises like diaphragmatic breathing. And this is something that I think is very important. And um, one of the things that um, I think that you should be practicing so that if you get into a crisis or a time where you're starting to flare, you can fall back on these exercises. So with diaphragmatic breathing, I'm gonna try to get, <laughs> What you, when you take a deep breath, you should be filling your stomach. And as you exhale, the stomach comes back. And take a deep breath and come back. So there's actually a nice diagram that shows you how to practice the diaphragmatic breathing. So um, that is something that is most effective. It's most effective when you're sitting up 
like you are listening to this uh, webcast. And the diaphragm is in its um, optimal position because with gravity, the diaphragm moves down. And as it moves down, it's pushing the belly contents uh, out. When you lie supine or on your back, the belly contents push up on the diaphragm, it makes it a little harder to breathe. I don't know if you can see it, but if you kind of grab the gallery and move it, if it's off on your right, the other exercise is called pursed lip breathing, which comes in through the nose and you breathe out through pursed lips, but you don't whistle with it. Um, and you take a breath in for two, out, you know, or in for two, out for four. And on the top is um, a free app that was um, generated by the Veterans Administration that I like that has, it, to me, it's like a metronome where you can control inhale and exhale. And you can actually play with it so that you can practice your breathing. And what's nice is, it's, it's a tool that you can use, much like the incentive spirometer they send you home with after a surgery, but you can actually train your breathing. Once you have that purse slip, you can actually put that into walking activities as you walk around your house and, and learn how to breathe more efficiently. The interval inspiration is actually teaching people to breathe hard and fast, and with this, they actually found that the respiratory rate went down. And the tidal volume is, is how much air do we move with our normal breath? It actually got larger and was more efficient. And so, so there was improvement in the breathing pattern. Also, they put a band around the chest and they found with these breathing exercises, people were able to increase the excursion of the intracostal or the rib muscles. When they looked at the breathing tests like you do in the office called a vital capacity, they really didn't see much change, but it did impact on their performance. So pulmonary exercises are something you can do and you can take this home, you know, you can be doing this while you're at home. The next thing is, is looking at resistive training. So this is our weightlifting. And there was a nice study that used um, people, and I actually forgot the number that's on there, but it's about 30 or so. And they used um, people with myasthenia. And on one side, they lifted weights, and I've got someone on there who's lifting weights as we're talking. Um, so they lifted weights with the upper body on one side, Oh, there it is, 11. And then on the other side, they did not exercise. And one of the things that 20, 30 years ago, we thought that exercise actually would make myasthenia worse. So this was actually very important and it showed that there were no adverse effects from the exercise with controlled myasthenia. And they were actually able to improve the amount of strength by about 23% which with a, with a um, two month program, many adults can get about a 30% gain. So 23% shows that we really can get strength with, with exercise training. Now, um, and there was no change in their fatigue. So what can you do at home? And the, I don't know if they come out very well, the drawings, but those TheraBands or rubber bands, you can use those and you can look online and find uh, activities to help improve strength. And they have a number of resistance, so you can increase the weight as you need. Um, other things that we can do to build strength are what I call functional exercises. So these are things that you can do at home, holding on to your kitchen counter, to your bathroom counter, something that's very sturdy. We don't want a chair or something that's going to move, but I'm gonna start this movie, but this is a full squat. Now, many of you may not be able to do a full squat because of orthopedics or other um, conditions, but as you do it, 
you can do a small or a partial squat with the knees bent. You want to make sure that your knees do not go over the feet because you may injure the, the, the knees and making sure that the back is straight. Um, so that's something that you can do at home and build the, the leg strength and maintain it while you are at home. The one that I think is most important is something that we call sit to stand. That's something that we've got to do every day is you get on and off the toilet, you get, you, when you get up out of your bed, you sit at the edge, then you stand up, you get out of the kitchen chair. So we do it many times, but it's important to do it with good posture, thinking about where, how we're doing it. And you'll actually be able to build strength and endurance with what we consider foundational exercises. So as you can see, in preparation for standing up, he has his feet firmly placed about shoulder width apart. His knees and feet, or knees and ankles are at about 90 degrees, the hips are. And, and you can use your hands to push up, but we wanna make sure you get your balance at the top of the, the stand. But this is a very good exercise. You can do it slower, and then you have a, a partial squat. So a nice way to get resistive training at home. You can put two dumbbells in your hand, start with you know, two or three weight, pound weights, then go to five and increase the force that you have. So how about aerobic exercise at home? So there's a nice study that actually came out of 2020 that looked at two groups. This is randomized. And they had one group that did 30 minutes of walking a day. And the other group did no exercise. They simply rested. And one of the scales that you'll find on the MG app when it comes back is the quality of life. It, they actually found a 50% increase or improvement with the group that exercised, but not in the rest group when they did this for three months. The exercise group also was able to walk further and faster than the group that did not exercise. So a six minute walk is um, a measure that we use in the studies I do with geriatrics. Six minutes is about how long it takes to go from your car to get back to the pharmacy so people were able to do it better, faster. So the, I, I think this is a very important um, study. The other thing in the exercise group, these individuals were able to lower their mastinon dose and lower their prednisone where the rest group wasn't. So you know, I, I find this very exciting. The more we can do ourselves, the better. Um, so how are you going to get that aerobic training at home? So one of the things that you can do is marching in place. Now this is a high step marching. And I always, again, like to be holding on for good balance. Um, you'll watch as he's doing it, his trunk is not moving, it's not going from side to side. Um, you can do this at raising to the ankle, raising the feet to the ankle, to the knee, or for more vigorous if you and um, marching takes a lot of, it gets my heart rate going. So, but always uh, pay attention to the um, posture. Another one that you can do is a lunge. And there are simple modifications of this, just stepping forward and back. This is a, a deep knee lunge. But these are things that you can do at home with a coach and making sure that you're safe to do it. But just to give you some ideas of some of the exercises that you can do. So now we are at the, the part like, let's tailor this for you. You know, so provided you with the data, we have the health benefits, but how do you get started getting active? So um, you, I don't know if you can read the questions well, but this is the quality of life revised form that has 15 questions, which I like to do sort of monthly or as you're just learning your MG 
to really see what symptoms are your most impactful to you and how they're how they're changing as you're getting on therapies or how does the exercise impact these so this is the quality of life scale the the second one is the activities of daily living and it goes through many of the symptoms that you have with mg and um, so many of you will be more in the zero to the two category um, the three category is when you're in crisis and we really should not be considering exercise and this may be when you're in the hospital. So, uh, but to see how the exercise impacts you, just to understand where you are. So I, I do like this scale. So the question is, is before we begin exercise, let's think about how your myasthenic symptoms may impact your activities. And everyone's myasthenia presents a little differently um, from everyone else on, on this webinar. The other thing is, is you may be different throughout the day. You may be different based on your medicines and activities may impact it. So these are the things that you want to sort of look at and then think about how to modify your activities. So um, drooping eyelids may make it, or double vision, may make it that you don't have your normal binocular vision, which makes it more difficult to have good depth perception. So it may make it more difficult to go up and down stairs. Uh, walking may be more difficult. So, if that's the case, what you may want to do is really make sure you're holding on to something firm as you're exercising. Um, like a, if you have a treadmill at home, I like the ones that have the railings so that you won't fall. Some of the ellipticals, if you have that or a, or a stationary bike, may give you the balance that you need. Or consider a seated activity like the seated yoga. The other thing is, is many of these apps or, um, I'm getting a little older now, the younger kids who are doing the virtual reality um, exercises and things may be very visually intense. And if you have a lot of ocular symptoms, it may tire your eyes. And I know I, my eyes get tired with all these Zooms. So you want to make sure you take a break um, and, and just consider that as you're thinking about what you want to do. Um, problems speaking or swallowing, I was trying to think about it, um, when you're exercising, just like swimming, we don't want to um, exercise alone. We always want to have someone close at hand or have our, our cell phones, but just make sure you can call if you need help um, with exercise. Always plan ahead. Um, it may make it difficult to handle the secretion, so have just a, a nice towel to kind of wipe up. Uh, neck weakness. So I've actually had a lot of patients who've had um, activities where if we need to sit upright for a long period of time, they find that their head really gets tired. So maybe consider a neck, neck brace for things that need um, to have you seated and just need that head support for a long time. The other thing are some of the bikes or have you at an angle bending over. So this angle of the neck puts a lot of strain. So think about maybe a more upright activity it, um, if neck weakness is a big problem for you. For arm weakness, many activities like some of the classes do things with the arms overhead and out to the side for a long period of time. Well, those sustained activities and repetitive things really tire the arm. So think about rotating, doing something with the upper arm and go to the legs, or you know, keep changing the activity so the arms don't tire, or modify the activity so that you're doing it so you're not engaging the shoulders as much. Um, you can do some of the stretching. Stretching is so important for us but the weight of our arms are very heavy. So um, consider stretching the arm, walking up a wall, or lying in bed, doing some of your stretching and activities where the arm can be supported. 
uh, leg weakness. Um, this is often a significant problem, especially hip weakness, which makes it harder to go up and down stairs, get out of a chair. So consider seated activities if your legs are very weak or you have problems with balance. Always have handheld support for safety. Breathing. So monitor your breathing very closely with your exercise. Um, so if you find that you can't talk as you're exercising, then let's back down the intensity a little bit. Uh, you need, as we talked about with the breathing exercises, um, some of the uh, weight machines and some of the stationary bikes may put you back at an angle where the diaphragm is not optimal. So think about being more upright. Um, sometimes people have more shortness of breath as they bend over. And so the abdominal contents push up, like when they're tying their shoes, that makes you very short of that breath. So think about your body and trunk position. Um, opening the chest is very important. If you can, one of the things that I think is very illustrative, if you slump right now in your chair and you try to take a deep breath, you really, it's hard to open the rib cage. But if you sit up, take your shoulders back, put the scapula back, and try to take a nice deep breath, you'll find that it's much easier. So really pay attention to your trunk position and your shoulder blades. Um, there are exercises you can do to engage the stomach with um, sit-ups while stand, sitting um, in your chair. So there's so many good things we can do. Um, time your activities with your medications. Many of you have greater weakness at the end of the day, you're worn out. So plan your more vigorous activities earlier. If you can rest, add that. Uh, heat is um, also something that really impacts many people with myasthenia. So if you like to garden, make sure you do it early in the morning or late at night when the sun is low. And I really am a fan of cooling vests and cooling towels, which I have here. Um, there was a, a nice study of six individuals with myasthenia, generalized myasthenia, aged 29 to 58, who um, engaged in activities, both wearing a vest and then not wearing a vest. And they found that muscle strength was actually improved when doing cooling. And also the amount of inspiratory force was much higher when people were doing um, cooling and, and they measured the core temperature to make sure it dropped by a degree. So I have two vests on there. The top one on the right is actually one that you get wet and then you um, put in a freezer or you just get it wet and it activates. It's about $30. Unfortunately, that doesn't work um, for where I live, where it's hot and humid right now, because you need, uh, when it's that humid, you just can't evaporate that, uh, the cooling fabrics don't work. So I like the, the second one here that's a little to its left, where it has the flexible, pliable cooling packs that you just put into pockets, and where it's important to keep cool is around the forehead. The neck is a good place to cool, Surprisingly, the wrists are a great way to cool your body down. And then the core, so the small of the back or the, the back. And so you'll be able to find you can do so much more with a cooling vest. Uh, many uh, people who want to watch the grandkids or the kids out at ball games and they can't go sit for in that 120 degree weather will find that they can stay outside a little better with these cooling vests. Not only do we, I have this reminder over here, um, not only do we want to cool the outside, but we can cool the inside with nice cool, cold water will help, help you get refreshed. Now, some people, there's a, a small percentage who myasthenia does worse with cold. Um, 
more so I find in the winter when they're trying to stay warm, they say they just, their myasthenia is worse. But I think the majority of folks, cooling is where we need to go. Um, so how can your myasthenia impact your, um, or how can your medications impact your myasthenia? Sorry about saying that wrong. So uh, many of you are on Mestinon and the duration of therapy really varies. And so early on when the disease is not as well controlled, it works for a much shorter period of time, maybe a few hours. As you start getting better, it lasts the four hours, six hours, and then some people don't even miss it as they get on immunosuppression and their myasthenia improves with of the other therapies. But what's important to know is how long does your mestinon work? So it, let's say it works four hours, which is sort of the typical duration of therapy. What we want to do is give ourselves about a half hour after taking mestinon so that we can absorb it from the, the digestive system, get it in the bloodstream. So you really want to plan your activities for about 45 minutes to, if you're four hours, in that three and a half hour time frame. That way you're gonna be at your best. You really don't wanna do it as you're coming off your mastodon. Uh, many people find that if they're on, uh, if they're refractory with their myasthenia and they're getting plasma paresis or sub-Q immunoglobulin or IVIG, that at the end of that four, four week or whatever their interval is, their exercise capacity goes down. So that may be a time that you need to modify. Uh, rituxan lasts any four months, six months, everyone is very different. So as you're coming to the end of whatever therapy you're at, really watch your activities so that you may need to modify at those times. So, um, uh, fatigue is real important. Um, we need to think about sustained activities. How can you, and repetitive activities, how can you modify your routine so that you can take a break then come back? And I have on the side there painting. Uh, with COVID, many people have decided to remodel and, and re-clean their house and take on tasks. Well, repetitive things like that painting really will do a number on the myasthenia if it's not well controlled. So let's get family and friends to help out with that. Um, overdoing it. Many people may, when they feel good, let's do as much as you can because so many things have piled up. But when you do that, then you pay the price because the next three days you're in bed. So it's much better to do things on a more consistent basis. Um, fatigue at the end of the day is an issue. Rest and sleep are so critical for myasthenia. The heat we already talked about, um, a number of people find that hot showers, hot baths really do them in. Even hot foods sometimes like tea or coffee. Uh, the humidity just makes the air thick and heavy for many people. So, you know, let's make sure you use the air conditioning. Uh, bright lights and sunlight, you know, wear a nice pair of polarized glasses, uh, good floppy hat to protect the eyes, um, avoid, there's many medicines, that is an important thing to have on the MGFA site, the meds to avoid. Alcohol can sometimes make increased fatigue, stress and anxiety, infections, definitely inflammation, and then um, always careful with exercise because a lot of times you replace with water, you want to make sure you're getting good electrolytes. Uh, potassium can go low with diarrhea or vomiting. So, you know, these are things that may limit your capacity. Um, so I have maybe two more slides and then we'll get to questions. So uh, what I think is important is really knowing where you're at before you start your exercise program, what is your capacity? So I, I have a, a step counter watch. You can get the old um, step counters, the ones that you put on your belt or many watches will now do it. And your phone, your smartphone usually has um, step counters as well. And many of us carry our phone in our, our pocket all the time. 
So to under how understand how many steps do we take? And what I think it's important is, is on a good day, know how many steps that you can do comfortably. And you just feel that you've got energy to spare, you can um, go all day. Um, think about it, was it your typical day or did you have extra shopping to do or you had an event, you had to go to some your nieces or nephews. And then if you walk excessively, how long did it take you to recover? Were you okay in 10, 15 minutes or did it, you know, it wiped you out for the rest of the day? Or did you have a debt that you had to pay for the next couple of days? So as an example, um, I said, you know, maybe 1,500 steps is where you are. And so if you do that, you feel like you've got energy to spare, you're okay through the day. You do the 3,000 steps, you went to see the doctor, they put you through the paces, all the muscle testing, asked you a ton of questions, or you went to get pick up some medications. Well, that day was exhausting. So what you want to do is plan your walking goal based on where you can succeed. Because we want to be consistent. And if we can get consistent, then we can get up over uh, a hurdle. So for this person who walks comfortably 1,500, let's, let's up the ante just a little bit and let's get it to 2,000 steps a day and see how you do. Just like the medicines, just like prednisone, you know, if we're gonna taper it, we're gonna do it over a few weeks to see what the effects are. So in a couple of weeks, let's add 500 more steps and see where you are push that goal a little bit. If, if 2,000 to 2,500, you weren't ready for it, it just exhausted you, go back to the 1,500 to 2,000 and recheck in two more weeks. So it's pretty easy, but we want to um, just think about what we can do. And so I gave some examples of walking. So we've got walking on stairs takes a lot more energy than um, our walking in that hallway, and that's a long hallway. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I like to do is keep a journal because that way we can track our progress. So many people lose sight of where they've been. So uh, for many people, myasthenia really just changes your life. And the things that you used to be able to do, you can't do. And especially if you've been hospitalized with a crisis, you've been bedridden for a few days, it's really going to take a lot to get back over that hump. And so you forget where you've been. So when you track your progress, you're like, you can see the gains that you're making. So when you do an activity, what I would like you to do is write it down. You know, I did three TheraBand exercises for my biceps, my triceps, and I did some lats with my, um, and I did three. And what you want to write is how long did it take you? The first time it may take a half hour to do three exercises with just three repetitions because you're going to rest and recover. Let's see how long it takes to recover. Then the other thing that you want to do is think about how exertional was that. You can do a simple scale like, ah, oh, that was light. It was a moderate ex um, exercise or it was so intense or you could use a perceived exertion. When you start, you really want that exertion level in that two to three kind of easy range because we want to start low and slow and build from that. Um, we certainly don't want you in that eight range where, you know, and then definitely not in that nine and 10 range. You know, once you build your exercise, Eventually, we'd like to get you in that six to seven range. But when you start with your exercise, start in that two to three uh, range to the four to five. The next question is, is, how did it affect your MG? We went through those symptoms. Did it, it bring out any of your double vision? Did it make your speech go? Did it affect your breathing? Are you not able to walk now, you know, because you did your exercise? How long does it take to recover? And then as you're thinking about, it, let's think about the time of day. When was your last dose of Mestinon? Did you take rests? 
how was your sleep the night before? So it's a lot of self-reflection with MG and exercise. And so, um, again, it's kind of takeaway things. Um, start low and slow. Keep it fun and, and make it yours. So if you like gardening, that's your exercise. Um, you know, it, but it has to be something you want to do to stay active because you want it to be consistent. Yeah, can you talk and then um, be realistic with your goals. Um, be mindful of your posture as you're doing everything. Uh, plan your rests. Allow time to assess your impact. Um, don't, you know, you felt good, just keep pushing. No, you know, you want to really hold back just a little bit and then see how you do. Consider getting a training partner or, or a trainer to really help guide you and provide you the coaching that you need or, or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. This exercise should be a part of your whole health and wellness plan. Make sure you have mindfulness, um, that you're looking at your emotional health, your physical health, your nutrition, your sleep. So it's just one part of, of your plan. And then uh, share your journal because for me, I have learned so much from my patients when they say, you know, I, I can take a two mile walk when I get this therapy, but as it's starting to wear off, now I'm, I'm struggling even to walk to the bathroom. So, you know, we just have real objective measures that help me guide our therapy. So thank you so much. And we've got about 15 minutes for questions. And I'm gonna let Jenna help me with the questions. Yeah, thanks, Charlene. Um, can you, do you mind, you can stop sharing your screen oh, yes, now. yes, yes. And I'll start going through the questions. We've got a few of them. Um, so the first one is from Cynthia and she's asked, are there exercises to increase grip strength? Um, you know, there's, um, one of the things I, th I think you need to be careful with with myasthenia is a lot of times the hands are very weak. And so um, just doing your daily activities is, is can be a lot. Um, there's therapeutic. Uh, sometimes there are grippers, but you want to just be careful of, of joint alignment so that we're not injuring the hand by overdoing things. And so, you know, make sure that you're allowing yourself to preserve your strength you need for your activities that are important for our daily life, writing, texting, and dressing and buttoning. Great, thank you. Um, got a couple questions about using creatine for working out and if that's something beneficial to use. You know, there was a initial studies of creatine actually showed it was beneficial and then they did the randomized trial and they found that it really did not benefit. And so you want to just be careful with nutritional supplements because the FDA does not regulate them as much. And so some of the preservatives and other, um, uh, it's not materials, but the other ingredients sometimes can cause problems, so. Okay, interesting. Um, Okay, this one is from Lisa. Lisa said, when I get going with exercising and I go every other day, I get really, really tired. Like I can't do anything at all. What can I do? I, sometimes, I also have went two to three times a week. What else can I do? So what I think is, is that you're doing too much on those every other day. So I do like that you're resting in between, but I think what you should do is half, the, half of what you're doing and see if you can succeed with that and try that for a number of weeks and then see if you can increase it. So I always sort of, we always overestimate what we can do. So um, take it down. If you can do it well, stay there for a while and then let's build that up after, over time. Great. This one is from Melissa. I sometimes get severely nauseated during exercise. I take that as a sign I've overdone it, even when it's not a lot. Could this be MG related to have a response when the muscles are overtaxed? Um, so, I, 
So when you get nauseous, it's what they call a, a vagal response. And so to me, it, it does sound like you're overdoing it. Uh, but you also want to ask your primary care about what, you know, what that means. Great. Um, this is from Susan. She says, MG is an autoimmune disease process. Does this mean we are immune compromised? Well, it, it does. Um, so in terms of thinking about COVID, I, I do think I, I be very careful because it is an autoimmune disease. Uh, many people on, are on immunosuppressive agents as well which increases their susceptibility to infections, which is why we're trying to do things, um, staying at home when you're out, wear the mask, but yes. Thank you. Um, okay, this one is when ex exerting minimal, with minimal exercises like walking or window cleaning, I have shortness of breath, almost where I'm hyperventilating. And it's scary. How can I see the signs and what can I do to improve ability to breathe when walking with exertion or or other moderate activities? So it definitely sounds like the window washing is too much. And so now it's time to ask someone else to help you with that task. Uh, but in terms of walking, uh, the slower you walk, sometimes you'll find that you don't get as winded, but if you're rushing, you're going to exert more energy. Uh, so try the purse lip breathing, do some practice, but, but that's a point where when you're that short of breath, simply walking around the house, you're not ready to start an exercise program. We're really addressing your basic needs. Sometimes dressing is an exercise all in itself. It can take a half hour to put on a pair of pants when you're very weak. So, you know, acknowledge that. And when you can do it better, you know, you just you start, start small and increase. So it might be time for a little bit, you know, talk to your MG doc, your neurologist. Thank you. This one is from William. William wants to know, is golf a good exercise? It is when you enjoy it. So um, the, it's a nice thing that you can do a, a more socially isolated. Um, you got to be careful with the heat. It does take a lot of upper body strength. Um, it, more than because you have the whole follow through, we've got a lot of balance. Um, so, you know, it is a whole body exercise and if you enjoy it, it is the best thing, but really be careful of the heat when you're out there. That's great. Um, this question is, uh, there's a couple. So just in general, for people getting started with exercise equipment, what are some not too expensive items that you would recommend people look into purchasing? Um, I, I, I like a good pair of shoes as the, <laughs> I think the most important thing. Start with the foundation, make sure you've got good support and you've got good padding on your, your, your feet. So that actually sets the tone for everything else. Um, in terms of equipment, I like the TheraBands. I like light weights because you can do them um, like if you're doing a bicep, if you're standing, you can incorporate it into many other moves, like at the sit to stand. So light weights, like 10, 12 pounds are really a good place to start. Some of you need the higher weights, so those tend to get more expensive. Um, other things are, you know, I... I walk around your house, you know, it's like many, if you have the space, it's safe. And when it's cool, that's, I like getting outside with your mask. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll do one more question. This is from Janet. Are there exercises to help with facial muscles, chewing, eyes, smile, et cetera? Uh, best thing is, you know, I just, uh, uh, 
use them as, as you can. Um, many people um, also use uh, ice to preserve, like for pictures, keep cool. Tom's got the smile going. Um, unfortunately, those are hard muscles to isolate and for the expression and, you know, I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap up here now. This concludes our webinar today. Thank you for all of your questions that were submitted. The ones that we were not able to answer or that we missed will be followed up with. I want to give a special thank you to Dr. Hafer Macko for a very informative session and let you know that MGFA will be hosting this wellness series throughout the summer. So please be on the lookout for additional invites. Um, this webinar is recorded and it will be available on the MGFA webpage as well. So if you are interested in being able to see the slides or some of the exercises that will be posted for you to see. Can Thank I just, you. can yeah. I just real quick, um, there was a great uh, thing that just came by um, speech therapy really can help out with the facial muscles and, and definitely helps with the, the speaking muscles. They can help not only build the strength, but also prevent strain. So, so that was good. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Yeah, so I got two, there were two of them, so <laughs> gotta plug that. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.